We are called to be a worshiping people. We are not spectators. And where do we participate? Active participation, as Vatican II says, in the Mass. All right? Now, I'm going to do something because I only have a few minutes. So I'm going to give you four years of seminary in four minutes. <laughs> All right? Now, Father Monsignor is still back there, so he's the rector. So um, I don't know if they have such a thing there as called the four-minute seminary class, but you're going to get it right now. Okay? I'm going to teach you four. It took me into my third year. I had ecclesiology. I had Christology. I had every other ology you can imagine. And it, it was like this. It was like, here was the piece of the puzzle here. There was a piece of the puzzle here. There was a piece of the puzzle here. But nothing put it all together until one day at Holy Apostles, it all clicked. And it was in Christology. And I'm sitting there listening to the priest teach this class. And all of a sudden, everything started to come together. And I'm sitting there in my chair just like this. And I'm like, don't you all see this? And all the other seminarians are like, what's wrong with Chris today? What the heck? And I'm sitting there like ready to jump out of my seat because all of a sudden, everything I had learned from 12 years of Catholic school, everything I had learned from philosophy at Franciscan University and three years in the seminary finally clicked. And I'm going to try my best to share that with you. The only Latin term I'm going to use is something called exitus reditus. That's the only term you got to know in terms of Latin, but I'm going to explain to you what it means. And it comes from the teaching of Thomas Aquinas, one of the greatest church doctors and theologians and philosophers we've ever had in the history of the Catholic Church. He explains everything in this one term. Our whole faith is based in one term, executioratus, which means this. All comes from God and all will return to God. All comes from God and all will return to God. And you know what? It all makes sense because I had just listened to a tape on Father Seraphim. You all know Father Seraphim, our little white-bearded priest who walks around the shrine. is amazing how I learned from him about divine mercy. And he taught me about God's three greatest acts of mercy. And then I'm learning in seminary about all comes from God and all returns from God, but nobody put them together for me. They perfectly match me and are placed together in the Mass. Here's how. Okay, we know we all believe in the Trinity, right? In the Trinity, we have, what, three persons, not three gods. Three persons and one God, right? Now, what do we attribute to God the Father? To God the Father, we attribute creation. We have God the Father up here, and all came from God the Father in creation. Okay? That was the first great act of mercy. Father Seraphim teaches creation. So here I am learning about exitus now, all coming from God the Father, and that's the first great act of God's mercy. Now what happened after God the Father created everything, and we got mankind out here, what happened? We got broken, right? We got broken. We fell. So in the second great act of mercy, what do we attribute to the second person of the Trinity? Redemption. So in the second great act of mercy, God the Father sent His Son. And the second person of the Trinity came down to earth to redeem us. The second great act of mercy. Redemption. Now, in the third and final great act of mercy, Jesus, through the power of the Holy Spirit, will return all of creation back to the Father wow. to live in eternity forever and ever. Now, check this out. You know when Jesus redeemed us, right? Now, did, did Jesus redeem all of mankind? Yes. Okay. Will, will all mankind be saved? How? How do you explain that? If you redeemed all of mankind, how was all of mankind not saved? Here's why. Because Jesus redeemed us when? On Easter Sunday. He opened the door to heaven, right? Guess when Jesus said, all of, or Thomas Aquinas, I'm sorry, said this. You know the number seven represents perfection, right? In time. The number seven represents time, creation. But you know what the number eight represents in Jewish tradition? Eternity. And you know what Jesus demanded that the Feast of Divine Mercy be? On the eighth day. Wow. 
Because you see, Jesus came down and on Easter Sunday he redeemed us. The next seven days is us now living in time and in creation. But it's on the eighth day that he is going to return us all back to God the Father. All of us are going to return back to God the Father on the eighth day to spend all of eternity with him. Now, that is salvation. So we have this opportunity to become divinized. To share in the third and final great act of God's mercy. Sharing in the divine nature. God became man so that man could become God. That became one of the greatest church fathers. It didn't mean God, meaning we're going to become the Trinity. But we will share in the life of the Trinity. It is at the Mass that this all happens. Did you all know that? In the Mass, you know, one of the things people say, it drives me crazy, is I don't go to Mass because I don't get anything out of it. What? The Mass is not about you. It's about what you give to it. It's about the worship of Christ. And what is the one word description of the Mass? Anybody know the one word description of the Mass? Sacrifice. Sacrifice. So you know what happens when you walk into that church every Sunday? God bless our Protestant brothers and sisters, but they will all tell us, why do you re-crucify Christ again on that cross? Why did you re-crucify him again? We are not. You know why we are not re-crucifying Christ? Even though every Sunday we go through this again and again. You know why we are not re-crucifying Christ? Because when you walk into that church, Pope Benedict wrote in the spirit of the liturgy, it's the only time ever that historical time, tick, 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 and, uh, uh, and sacred time, the time of God. Because remember, God's outside the time of stopwatch. For God, everything is one big moment, one big eternal round. Pope Benedict says it's the only time where those two come together. When you walk in the door at church, you are at the foot of Calvary. You are actually there. Christ isn't being crucified again. You are there at the foot of Calvary as that priest in persona Christi, who is now Christ, in his place, is offering back that sacrifice to the Father. Now, what are we all supposed to do, as Father just said? We are supposed to put our sacrifices as Vatican II taught you all. You all share the priesthood of Christ. Priest, prophet, and king. As a priest, you are to offer sacrifice of every stumbling block you have during your day, every pain, every suffering. You offer it up on that pattern because that pattern is the sacrifice of Jesus through him, with him, and in him, God Almighty Father. It's all going back to the Father through the sacrifice of the Son. So do not miss that boat. Jesus is the captain. He's on that boat. He's saying, all aboard. Don't miss it. Because he's taking it back home. So at the Mass, Vatican II teaches, as a priest, you are to put your sacrifices on that pattern, your whole being, your family, your prayers, your sacrifices, everything you have goes back on that path to be returned with Christ back to the Father. You see, that's what the Mass is. You know, the angels tell us at every Mass in the Catholic Church, you know, the roof opens up and the angels come down and they ascend and they descend and your guardian angel is with you in that pew and the angels come down and heaven and earth is connected. Heaven and earth is connected at the Mass. You know, I explain, I'll end with this. I teach my kids in uh, confirmation about, let me give you guys an example I was teaching. And I think maybe you guys could, could learn something on this too because I think it applies and we don't think about this. If you were sent before a judge because you were guilty of a crime, which you know we all are, sin. Sin is a crime against God, right? And you went before the judge and the judge says, you're guilty. You're guilty. You are. I am. We all are. And then the judge says, your sentence is hell. He's justified in saying that, right? Because what's the penalty for sin? Eternal death. Right? And what is hell? Life in prison. So if the priest, if the, if the, if the judge, I'm sorry, say your sentence is hell, what if the priest says your sentence is life in prison? That is hell, right? All of a sudden, through the back doors of that courtroom, in walks a man you've never seen before, but he's 
wearing a robe and sandals and long hair. And he comes up and he says, Your Honor, I will pay Betty's bail. I will pay her bail. I will make the payment to the judge. Now the judge says in response, Okay, I accept that. Now this is God the Father. Accepting the offer of the Son to ransom us, right? On our behalf. Now, what if the judge says, okay, to work out all these details, you've got to come back Sunday morning at 8, 10, or 12 o'clock. <laughs> Who in their right mind would not come back Sunday morning at 8, 10, or 12 o'clock? Because you know what's happening at Sunday morning at 8, 10, and 12 o'clock? Christ is paying to the sacrifice of the cross which you are at at Calvary. He is paying the debt to the Father so he can return all of us back to him to spend all eternity. And what's the beautiful grace of Divine Mercy Sunday? It promises what? Complete forgiveness of sin and punishment, right? Why? Because you're being bathed from head to toe and you're being made spotless. Because before you can enter heaven, you've got to be spotless. So what God is offering us, Father Serpent says, is like a second baptism. It's a cleansing from head to toe. That we have Divine Mercy Sunday and that special day of grace that we can be cleansed to be ready to be wearing the wedding feast of the Lamb, the pure white, pure velvet, pure um, uh, vestment to be returned to God the Father.